We found our two eigenvalues for the matrix A, which I'll rewrite. 0, 1, 2, 1. And we want to find E negative 1, which of course is the null space of A minus lambda I. So it's null space of, we'll find A minus lambda I. That's A plus I. So lambda was negative 1. So A plus, A minus lambda I is A plus I. So that'll be 1, 1, 2, 2. Anybody want me to show more details? I'm just adding one times the identity to the A matrix. So it just picks up one in the diagonal. So that zero became a one and the one became a two. So that's all I did right there without writing those little steps out. All right, so I'm gonna find the null of this matrix. So we're going to set up our uh, augmented matrix. With, augmented with zeros because we're finding the null space here. Minus two row one. And we're done right here. Our x2, so we got x1, x2, x2 is free. So our x2 is t, x1 plus x2 equals zero x1 equals negative x2, so x1 equals negative t. <clears throat> so we're going to get negative 1, 1 times t. So any questions on our null space computation here? Yeah, uh, yeah, so we added the identity, so basically our diagonal went up by one, right there. And then we want the null space. All right, so x1 is x negative x2, we get this right here, so we can write e negative one is the span. Oh, I don't have enough space right there, I'll write it down here. e negative one equals span of negative one, one. Okay, so we got our two eigenspaces. Now these are subspaces of R2. So individually these are both subspaces of R2. Are they linearly independent? You should be able to tell by just looking at their spans. How do you know if two vectors are linear, linearly independent? So that probably would tell us if they are uh, 90 degrees apart or orthogonal. So if you have two vectors, how do you know they're linearly independent? So we can do a linear combination equals zero, and if we only, we only get the trivial solution. Now there's an easier way. If there's exactly two vectors, what property would they have if they were dependent? So they're not multiples. So the only way they'd be dependent is if they were multiples. So these are independent. And that means they're, uh, just looking at dimension, span, so we have two vectors that are independent. How many dimensions will this span have? Two. We got two vectors, they're independent, they're going to form a basis of a two-dimensional vector space. We already see this is a subspace of R2. So this is a subspace of R2. It has the same number of dimensions as R2, so it is all of R2.
So that means it spans all of R2. And we can take any vector in R2 and write it as a linear combination of these two vectors. So that's exactly what we're going to do. So I'm going to go 30 pages up to our original problem. Here's our original problem. So what we just did is turned our matrix into, we broke it down with the eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Now what we're going to do is look at our vector, 5, 1, and write it as a linear combination of eigenvectors. So we're going to write 5, 1 as a combination of those two vectors I just wrote down. All right, so do that right now. I can get that started. So this is a linear system you're solving. You should be able to solve it. I'm just going to give you a minute for solving this one. So I got two, negative three. So any questions on that part right there? So again, we want to find that matrix A to the 17th power times the vector 5, 1. So what I'm going to do is replace 5, 1 with that linear combination at the top of the screen. So I just replaced 5, 1 with that combination. Now I'm going to distribute here. I'm going to get <laughs> fancy and distribute and commute our scalar at the same time. So again, I can bring my scalar in front of that matrix, but I cannot bring the vector in front of the matrix. So I did make a scalar uh, commute right there, and that's totally fine. And I'm going to do the same thing to the second. Now we're going to use the theorem. I'll rewrite it really quick. So we can raise a, a to the n times x is the same as lambda to the n times x when 
lambda and x are eigenvalue and eigenvector. So when I say eigenstuffs, I just mean the, the pair value and eigenvalue, eigenvector. All right. The entire reason that we did that linear combination is because 1, 2 is an eigenvector of the matrix A. What value was associated with 1, 2? So 1, 2, the lambda is 2. So right there, 1, 2, the lambda is 2. So now we're going to use that information for 1, 2. I'll just write that little lambda equals 2. And for negative 1, 1, our lambda value was negative 1. So 1, 2, our lambda was 2. So I see 1, 2 right here. What that means is I can replace a to the 17th by lambda, uh, was that 2? I think that was 2. 1, 2, our lambda was 2. By 2 to the 17th power, and our second lambda was negative 1. And again, I can only do this because I have eigenvalue uh, and eigenvectors. So I only can do this because these two are eigenvectors of A. I can make this swap. And then all we have is 2 to the 18th power, which is a huge number. Uh, negative 1 to the 17th power is not a huge number. And that's negative 1, canceling the negative. So we get 3 times negative 1, 1. And you can, if you have a calculator, go 2 to the 18th, but you better have a good calculator because most of them will give up at some point. I think Wolfram will tell you what 2 to the 18th is, but it's a very big number. But at least we got it down to this right here. All right, so any questions? I know that was combined a lot of things together. So if we generalize what we just did, it is a theorem we can write down. So we start with n by n matrix. And let's say that this has eigen vectors v1, v2 to vm and eigenvalues lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda m. Any vector x in the span of these vectors And <clears throat> if you notice, uh, well, first of all, what dimension is our vector, would our vectors be, given the size of the matrix? So A is an n by n matrix. So we have n rows and columns. What size vector would I multiply by? Too much thinking. What size would their vector be? n by 1. So it'll be a, an n uh, from rn. Now, I purposely did not choose n down here. 
If I chose n here, then I'd be assuming there's the exact same number of eigenvectors as there is dimensions. There very well could be less. You'll never get more, but you'll frequently get less. So when m is less than n, span is not all of Rn. So when m is less, your dimension of your span is dimension m, which will be less than your whole space. So any x that is in this span, what you can write, so of course that means x is the linear combination, i equals 1 to m, a i v i. And a to the kx, we can write it as summation alpha i lambda i to the k vi i equals 1 to m. So this is the process that we just did where we turned multiplying by a matrix into multiplying by a linear combination of those um, eigenvalues right there. So we did this for two dimensions just now but it can be done for three, four, five, any number of dimensions, as long as you're in the span. This is our last Eigen theorem. Well, until we look at transformations, but our last one for now. So start with the square matrix. <coughs> if A has distinct eigenvalues, meaning no repeats, then the eigenvectors are linearly independent. So one corollary of this theorem, if you have, in this case, you have an n-dimensional vector space, if you have n different eigenvalues, then none of them can be repeats and your eigenvectors would be linearly independent, and you would have n of them, so you would span the entire space of your vectors. So if you have distinct eigenvalues, your eigenvectors are independent, and if you have the same number of values as your dimension of your space, you, your vectors will span your entire space. So now we're going to get into the next chapter, which is linear transformations. So we've already performed linear transformations in this course. We're just going to look a little bit more carefully at them. Oh, the word I want started at the end. Linear transformations, all right. Somehow transformers was higher, more popular than transformations. Very sad.
All right, so we'll start out with our, the, let's see. We'll start with some defining properties. That'll be a good place to start. All right, well, let's go over function real fast. You've seen this word function before, so I'm not going to write down the definition, but what's the one function rule? Starts with inputs. Each input. Too many rules. Each input has an output. That's a function. If you give it an input, you will get an output. You won't get two outputs, you won't get no outputs, you'll get an output. Uh, now, of course, it doesn't have to be unique output. If it was unique output, what would we call that type of function? That'd be one to one. So if each one has a different output, has its own output, that's one to one. And of course, that means you can invert it. Oh, invert, inverse. We've seen that before. It's gotta be something with matrices. All right, so we're we'll start with the linear function. So a function is linear if there are two properties it has to satisfy. I'm gonna use the letter T for functions now. And it needs to go from Rn into Rm. All right, first property T of u plus v needs to be T of u plus T of v. Algebraically, what does this look like? It looks like distribution algebraically. It turns out it is distribution algebraically. But functionally, I just I like to think of this as it splits up over addition. So it preserves addition. So if you add inside the two inputs, it's the same as taking the inputs separately, adding the outputs. So basically you can add inside the inputs or add the outputs. So I'll just write here, function respects addition. Second property, so if we think of vectors, you can add two vectors, what's another common operation you can perform on vectors. There's a lot of things you can do. We can multiply, but we can't just multiply anything. We can multiply scalars. So we have a scalar alpha v that the function respects scalars, meaning I can multiply, I can scale the input would be the same as scaling the output. So scaling the output, that means apply the function t of v and multiply the result by alpha. So it basically looks like alpha and t are commuting. Oh, I know scalars that commute with matrices. So it turns out that second property right there is just scalars and matrices commuting. Algebraically, that's all that's gonna be happening. All right, so this is what a linear function, uh, the two properties a linear function has. So if you've been through calculus, the derivative is a linear function. Splits up over addition and scalar multiplication. Antiderivative is a linear function. Splits over addition and scalar multiplication. That uh, those functions are very different than every function we're working with in linear algebra. So those are not those are linear operators, but that's about as much as they have in common. They're just linear operators, but they would have these properties, or they do have these properties. All right, now we're going to look at transformation. Transformation is a function from one vector space to another. So 
So let's do an example. So A, well first of all, A is not a square matrix. Everything we've done in the last week or almost two weeks have been square matrices. What was the main property that we needed to have a square matrix for? Determinant or inverse matrix. And those are strongly related. So if your determinant is zero, you don't have an inverse. But just looking right here, does it make sense to talk about the inverse of A? Nope. So right away, um, A is not going to have an inverse as a matrix. It turns out that it won't have an inverse as a transformation either, as a function. So if y equals a x, first thing, how many dimensions is y? Alright, so set up your a x and write down the dimensions underneath. So A has rows 3 and columns 2 and X has 2 rows 1 column. So our inner dimensions match, that means we're allowed to multiply and we get Y, our dimensions of Y are going to be 3 by 1. So. How many dimensions is y? y is going to be a three-dimensional vector. So what this means, this matrix A, when we multiply, our inputs are two-dimensional, our outputs are three-dimensional. That's a little bit strange. So we're going to take a two-dimensional input and we're going to get a three-dimensional output. So as a function, I'm going to let TA be the function that corresponds to left multiplying by A. So that means TA of X is just A multiplied by X. So when I write TA of X, that's just multiply on the left by A. All right, so let's look at domain of TA of X. So what are the two domain rules I told you in pre-calculus class? <coughs> There's really three. What's one of the rules? Don't divide by zero. What's another rule? That would be a one to one. Don't do square root of a negative. negative. And if we have logs, don't do a negative inside of a log. All right, our function has none of those going on. Uh, we're just multiplying by a matrix. So if we look back up here, if we just look to AX, so this matrix A, one, zero, two, negative one, 3, 4, multiply left by x, which is x1, x2. Let's go ahead and multiply this across and down. So I'm going to get x1 and then 2x1 minus x2, and then 3x1 plus 4x2. 
All right, no, none of those three things I mentioned are happening here. We're not dividing by anything. We're not taking any square roots or fourth roots or six roots, and there's definitely no logs. So what that means in our domain, we have a full domain. All valid inputs are in the domain. So that means our domain is all two-dimensional vectors. You can put any x1, x2 value in and not have a problem. You won't have any of those divided by zero or negative square roots. So domain is all of R2, any two-dimensional vector you can put in. Range is more tricky. Let's just look at the dimensions of this. So we saw that our range is going to be some elements of R3, some elements of three-dimensional space. Our input is two dimension. What that means is our output at maximum could be two dimensions. So you can't get a three dimensional output. Yes, it will live in a three dimensional space, but it's either gonna form a point, a line, or a plane in three dimensional space. It's not going to form, it's not gonna cover all three dimensions. So what we're gonna do is try to find the range. One way to write the range out, it's a little <coughs> bit silly, but you could feed the function every valid input. So this is take all of R2 and apply the T function to it. So take every single element in R2 and apply the T function to it. All right, how long would this take to compute? Forever. So that's not very reasonable to compute it in this way right here. Just take every vector and apply this uh, to it. What we could do is get a basis of R2 and see what it does to each basis element. So what's an easy basis for R2? How many basis elements will I need? Two. two. So our dimension is two, so you need one for each dimension. So I need a linear combination. So I could do 15 pi and then square root two, negative one. Why would I do that though? That's crazy. There's a way better basis here. Now it's easy to tell these are independent because they're not multiples of each other but I did just pick a some somewhat absurd combination. All right, why is zero, zero never going to work? What's the problem with zero, zero? It is trivial, so what about in linear independence if you have a zero vector? You automatically fail linear independence. Because I can multiply my zero vector by a non-zero add it to zero times the other vectors, and then have a non-trivial combination. So zero, zero should never be in your basis. All right, we forgot the tri trivial or the canonical basis. Take the x vector and the y vector. So one, zero, zero, one. So that's the easiest basis you have for n-dimensional space. All right, let's see what the A matrix does to each of these. So TA of one, zero, that means multiplying the left by the A matrix. So we have one, two, three. Now I'm going to apply the TA function to the second base element, which is zero, one. zero, negative one, four. So now we're gonna use a linear property of the TA function. So that is since T 
PA of alpha U plus beta V. I'm going to use both linear properties, so I'll use them one at a time. <coughs> so this first property I'm using is the function, the linear function respects addition. So addition inside is the same as addition outside. So that's our first linear property. The second one, I could bring my scalars out front. So it's alpha TAU plus beta TA of V. So what this means, any linear combination could be re, uh, applying the T function to any, any linear combinations the same as a linear combination of the results of applying the T function to those vectors. That means TA of R2 is TA of the span 1, 0, 0, 1. TA of, I'll write this in set notation, so I'm just rewriting the span in set notation here. Now we can apply the TA function to all these elements. And we computed, at least I think we did, right there, TA is 1, 0. So that's alpha 1, 2, 3 plus beta 0, negative 1, 4. All right, so I'm just rewriting our linear combination after we apply the T function. How can I rewrite this final version as a span? It's so the span of what? So it's any linear combination of these two vectors that you're looking at. So it's a span of the vector one, two, three and the vector 0, negative 1, 4. So that is the TA of R2. So if you look at what does R, what happens to R2 when you apply the TA function, it hits every vector in this span right here. So these are independent, so our span will be two-dimensional. So it's going to hit every vector that's in this span right here. And this is the range of the TA function. So again, I had to look at basis elements of R2. I could not use eigenvectors here because we didn't have a square matrix. So it would make no sense at all to think about eigenvectors, eigenvalues. Only with square matrices can you do that. So our next example
a linear transformation. That linear transformation from R2 to R2. That is a counterclockwise rotation, CCW counterclockwise rotation by 90 degrees. All right, so I want a linear transformation that rotates 90 degrees. Counterclockwise means we have a clock up in the front of the room here, so it means rotating kind of up to the left. If you look at the top of the circle, your top is going to the left. That's what counterclockwise means. Yes. All right. Basis vectors helped out last time. Let's think of what those basis vectors look like here and what their rotations will look like. So I'm going to write an R2 basis here. So we'll have our first basis element 1, 0, and our second basis element 0, 1. So we'll graph those two out, 1, 0. So that's E1, there's E2. Now we're going to rotate these 90 degrees counterclockwise. So that means E2 is going to be pointing to the left. E1, well, this is T of E2 and T of E1. This is the transformation of each of those. So any questions about what's happening here? So we're just taking, you can take your uh, left hand, your thumb is E1, your pointer finger is E2, and then just rotate it. So that's all that's happening. All right, what are the coordinates? So I'll write the coordinates of E2 and E1. So E2 is 0, 1. E1 is 1, 0. What is T of E1? What are those coordinates now at the top? So that's 0, 1. What about T of E2? Negative 1, 0. So we know where the base elements go. All right, so let's just summarize that. T of 1, 0 equals 0, 1. And T of 0, 1 equals negative 1, 0. So we just took two basis elements for R2 and looked, like, looked at what the T function did to them. How many dimensions would the matrix that represents T have? We're going from two-dimensional space to two-dimensional space. Two by two, we're not changing dimensions, so we're gonna have a square matrix transformation. If your matrix <coughs> is not square, that means you're gonna have different dimensions. So if your matrix, the previous example, our matrix was taller and thin, so we increase dimensions. If your matrix is short and wide, you are going to decrease dimensions. If your matrix is square, you preserve your dimensions. So our t, uh, t the matrix that represents T is gonna be two by two. questions on that two by two size right there. Currently that's all I know about it. So we'll just fill it in with generic coefficients. I'll just use letters from the alphabet, A, B, C, D. So it's some two by two, A, B, C, D. You have enough information here to compute A, B, C, and D. So I'm going to set up the two equations that will let us compute it. They come right off of, all we're doing is plugging in right here, 
a, b, c, d times one, zero equals zero, one. And the other, a, b, c, d times negative one, zero, oops, times zero, one. equals negative one, zero. All right, so we have just enough time to set up one of these systems. I'll do the one, the first one we wrote down. So I'm going across and down. So we have A plus zero B, and in the bottom we have C plus zero D equals zero, one. So right there, I know A and C. A is zero, C is one. All right, find what the other equation tells you right now. And all you're doing is multiplying across and down. So we got A is zero, B is negative one, C is one, D is zero. So that matrix that I just wrote down is the transformation matrix that corresponds to this rotation. This is the rotate counterclockwise by 90 degrees matrix. You can of course check by multiplying the basis elements here. And that is all we have time for today.